may you explain more of mindfulness which relates to no me or no I. Just cannot, just c connect to a form of energy. Shall we practice this as lay person, layman? Sometimes we need I to understand others' feelings and so on. Okay. Initially, this teaching of non-self, anatta, can be challenging and confusing. Because some people say, what do you mean, no me, no I? I exist, right? You know, my name is so-and-so, you know, I live at this address, I have a job, maybe I have a family. What do you mean, no I? So, very simple. We all have an I, we all have self. But when we investigate, we realize the self is only a conditioning in the mind, based on thinking, memory, language, and of course, we need labels to communicate, right? I, you, he, she. We need them, we need these things. But when we investigate, you begin to understand the conditioning. And this is something the Buddha investigated. And he realized that this I is only conditioning in the mind. It's not something permanent. Mm. It's not something which is fixed, concrete. And it's not something that is separate and independent from the rest of nature. But when we are always using I, 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 I all the time, and we are not mindful, this I, it feels separate, doesn't it? Because as we said, we are always saying, you know, I'm seeing something, I'm hearing something, I'm eating, tasting something, mm -hmm. I'm smelling something, I'm feeling something, and of course I am thinking something. Mm -hmm. That duality in the mind. So the I does feel separate. And because we're using I all the time, and the equivalent in other languages, and as you know, if you're talking a lot in one day, you can use this I hundreds of times, right? Two, three hundred times. So because we're using the same I to communicate, you know, I, 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 it feels permanent. It feels everlasting. Everlasting means it's always there. It feels, uh, you know, rock solid. When we see changes around us, but the eye never changes, right? But actually, it's an illusion in the mind, created by the repetition of this label that we have to use. But it. It takes mindfulness, investigation, and you realize it's just a label that we have to use. And when you have the awareness, of course, you still have to use the word I to communicate, but you no longer become attached to it. In other words, you no longer take yourself seriously. Hmm? Because you have the awareness, you have the understanding that the I is only a label. And of course, this is one of the benefits of going on a silent retreat. Because hmm? you're talking less and less, and you don't have to be using I. But, uh, but at the same time, even on a silent retreat, sometimes you're still thinking I, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But when you're more mindful, more calm, more present, you see that the I is just a thought. It's just a thought. Because this is what the Buddha realized. Because you see, normally, the way we're all brought up, conditioned, is always, always thinking, right? You're always thinking. And it is our mental world that creates our uh, reality. And of course, I like, I don't like, I want, I don't want, 
you know. I prefer this, I don't like this, and so on. Hmm? Or what's going to happen to me in the future? Hmm? When you worry too much about the future. Because I went through that, this same problem when I was in a university. Because I was very frustrated thinking too much about the future. You know, am I going to uh, graduate? Am I going to get a job? Hmm? And after a job, you know, am I, am I going to get married? Just to please my parents? <laughs> Life can be so confusing and you feel so much anxiety, right? So much anxiety about the future. Because hmm? that's what thinking is. Now, actually the state of awareness or mindfulness is actually a state of non-self. Hmm? You can say it is the unconditioned state of mind. Unconditioned. Some people call it beginner's mind or original mind. Because when we were young, the awareness we have today is the same awareness we had when we were young. It doesn't change. And it's always now, it's always present. Whereas our thinking is always based on past and future, right? That's just the nature of thinking. But as adults, we can understand it. Because young children don't understand the state of awareness. But it's a natural state. And if you, if you grew up like in a kampung, kampung environment, and I grew up in, a, in the rural tropical island, I spent most of my childhood outdoors, you know, with nature. I didn't have television, thank goodness. And I didn't have all these, you know, electronic gadgets that kids have today, and you know, video games, and now a smartphone, and all that stuff. I was so fortunate, I didn't have all those things. I was just al always outside. I sometimes would climb trees, you know, with my friends. And it was mango season, you know, we were like little monkeys, eating mango. Or going to the river, swimming, and we used to catch uh, uh, river prawns, shrimps, you know, we call them crayfish, and we used to cook them. <laughs> and if people are growing corn, we used to go steal corn. <laughs> we were very naughty, like little monkeys, but it was a wonderful way to grow up. And I remember the, the mind being in a state of wonder, you know? You, everything is just magical, because your mind is not conditioned yet. You have a sense of wonder, beauty, and I remember each day was timeless. I don't know if you can remember that. Each day was timeless. Now, there's a practice in mindfulness that you can see body-mind process. You see rupa and nama, physical and mental process. Because in truth, that is what we are. We are a process of body and mind. And we are alive because we are a process. If we were not a process, we wouldn't be alive. And it's very complex. And now even the digestion process, which is working now after lunch, is very, very complex. Once I took a course in biochemistry, and we learned about the digestion process. And only then I realized how complex it was. But fortunately, the intelligence of the body can deal with this complexity. We don't have to worry about it. Unless you're having digestion problem. Then, of course, you need special uh, treatment. But if you don't, the body takes care of it. Very complex. So many enzymes and acids, you know are at work to break the food down. And then the body absorbs nutrition and it expels the rest. Very complex. And of course, being a process, we have to keep recharging it, don't we? 
of the keep recharging this process. The same way you recharge your handphones. Same way. And if you don't recharge it, you get weaker and weaker and you pass away. And throughout history, many people, you know, died this way, you know, starvation. Millions of people in, in China, India, Africa, so many countries. But fortunately, we don't have, have that problem today. So there's a practice using mindfulness. For example, the physical sensation of the breath, hmm, that is rupa, hmm, the body, and the awareness of that sensation, that is mind, hmm, the mental, nama. Hmm, you see body and mind. Physical and mental. Rupa Nama. And when you see it in your mindfulness, there is no self. Only Rupa Nama. Body, mind, process. And sometimes it is easier to see it when you're doing a dynamic practice. For example, say if you're doing mindful walking, the feet moving and stepping, that's rupa, the body, and the, f and the awareness of the legs, you know, the feet moving and stepping, that is mind. You see, body and mind. Rupa Nama, that's all. No I, no me. Only body mind process. And with the hand movements, very easy. Right? The hands moving and touching. Right? That is the physical Rupa. And the awareness of the body moving and touching is mind. Rupa Nama, that's all. No self. Because when you're on a retreat, you can see this very easily. Everything you do, even mindful eating, you just, same thing. Only body and mind. You know, the tasting, chewing, swallowing, and the awareness of the eating, the chewing, the swallowing, his mind. Even the washing, you can see that when you wash, only body, mind. This is one of the most direct ways of seeing non-self. No I, no me. Only body, mind. Rupa Nama. So we're all Rupa Namas here, or Nama Rupa. We're all Nama Rupa sitting here. No Bante, no Tan, no Go, whatever your name is. Very interesting. No man, no woman. No doctor, lawyer, computer engineer, whatever you do. These are only social labels. So if you ask who is sitting here talking, Nama Rupa or Rupa Nama, that's all. See, even Prime Minister, same thing, Rupa Nama. <laughs> President, same thing, Rupa Nama, Nama Rupa. Queen of England, same thing, Nama Rupa, Rupa Nama. All subject to sickness, aging and death. It's very profound, but it's very simple also. Rupa Nama, Nama Rupa.
and you begin to see that the I arises only when the mind says I. Yeah? You know, I want, I don't want, I like, I don't like, and so on. You see that? Because normally, when the mind says I, we think this I is who we are, right? Because that's the way we're all conditioned. Because we identify so strongly with the thought process. So when the mind says I, we think this I is who we are. And that's why we suffer from neurosis. Hmm? Neurosis is when we are trapped in thinking. Hmm? We are deluded by thinking. Hmm? And thinking is very limited. Hmm? And we are all conditioned with the same thought process. And thinking is coming from three things in the mind. I think it's on one of your handout. It's responding to memory, past experience, and knowledge. You can add the word information. Memory, past experience, knowledge, information. You can see it, very simple. It's not rocket science, you know, rocket science. Very simple. Unfortunately, I was able to, to read and later meet this very profound teacher in India who gave me this insight. Because one of the questions I was asking before I went to India was, what is thinking? Nobody is teaching me this in school. <laughs> right? We're only taught subjects and we have to study, study, study to pass exam. But nobody is teaching us what is thinking. And it we're thinking all the time. And we identify with all thinking. So it is not surprising that we end up being very deluded, very neurotic. And of course, if you meet a very neurotic person, you can tell. You know, they're very tense when you see them talking, very tense. And they're totally trapped in thinking. And of course, the I. Hmm? They really think this I is who they are. And a very neurotic person is very insecure. Hmm? Very insecure. Always tense. Always worried. Hmm? Having a lot of regrets a lot of desires, a lot of guilt, a lot of guilt. Guilt is a universal problem. I see that. And it's because of the judgmental mind. You know, we are conditioned with this judgmental mind. You know, when we make mistakes, it is natural to have regrets, mm, very natural. You know, I shouldn't have done that, I shouldn't have said that. Mm, I should have done that, I should have said that. You know, I'm so terrible, I'm so awful, I'm so stupid, and so on. But when we keep regretting and feeling guilty, we end up torturing ourselves. Mm. We create a lot of dukkha, suffering, conflict. So this is why when we make mistakes, it's important that we forgive ourselves because we're human and we're not perfect. And we all make mistakes, believe me, even famous monks make mistakes because we're human. But because of our social conditioning, we think that we should be perfect, you know? I ought to be perfect. But that is only a concept, the idea hmm, that we should be perfect. And guilt is an aspect of fear. Hmm? Because of the negativity. 
the second is suffering from depression. Part of the de depression is the negative thoughts and the labels you put on yourself. Just like when we're having a conflict with somebody, we tend to put negative images on that person, right? That person is, you know, terrible, awful, mean, nasty, and so on. And we do the same to ourselves. You know, self-blame, self-criticism. And think, oh my God, I've created, you know, bad karma. I'm going to have bad rebirth. I'm going to be punished somehow. And if you're a Christian, you know, God is going to punish me. I'm going to go to hell. And so on. You see how it's related to fear? And what is people going to think of me? Because I've done this, I've done that, you know. I'm so awful, I'm so stupid. Yeah, the fear of public opinion. So this is why the benefit of loving kindness is so good. Because in loving kindness practice, we replace those negative judgmental thoughts with kind, positive thoughts. May I be well, happy, and peaceful. May I be free from fear, conflict, and delusion. May all beings be well, happy, and peaceful. May all beings be free from fear, conflict, and delusion. Very beneficial. And that's how we learn to forgive others too. Because I know sometimes it's not easy to forgive others, you know, who have hurt us, who have cheated us, who have let us down somehow, very difficult. But one of the things that to remember is that no one is perfect. You know, I'm not perfect and no one else is. Hmm? Everyone has their, you know, mental defilements. And this is why sometimes when people behave unwholesome to you, being mean, unpleasant, and so on, try not to take it personally. Just realize it's that person's problem. They're having a problem, it's not you. So we all make mistakes. Yes, so anyone can practice. You don't have to be a monastic or whatever to practice. This is mindfulness, isn't it? Hmm? To understand non-self. Hmm. So we do have a self, but it's only language and memory and so on. Hmm. For example, you know when you meet somebody for the first time, and naturally you talk about yourselves, right? When you talk about yourselves, what do you talk about? It's all personal history, isn't it? Based on memory. All personal history. And if you're in the working world, you talk about your work history. You know, movies you have seen, TV programs you have seen, books you have read. If you travel, you speak about your travel experiences. Sometimes you speak about unpleasant memories, you speak about pleasant memories, but it's all based on memory. And with that, of course, we have future plans, future goals, hmm? because it's related to thinking. So thinking, as we said, is is a response to memory, past experience, knowledge, information, and it is always projecting itself in the future. Mm. We can all see this. All our minds do this. Mm. Thinking is a movement in time, from past to future, past to future. Right? You can see that. And it doesn't matter what language you think in. Hokkien, Cantonese, Spanish, Russian, French, you know. It doesn't matter what language, it's the same thought process. Hmm? Same thought process. Moving from past to future, past to future. 
And that's why we're all conditioned with this idea of time. This is why uh, practice is so beneficial, because it gives us, a, it shows us a timeless state. Of course, if you have to work, you know, you have to follow time, right? You have a schedule and so on. We can't escape that. And humans have created, you know, calendars, you know, years, months, weeks, days. But you'll notice a, a dog or a cat or a bird is totally not interested, <laughs> right, in human time and calendars. Just like a young child, the same thing. And the wonderful thing about mindfulness, it gives us the ability to come back to that timeless state, even for half an hour, just to be silent just to feel that timeless dimension. Because we're actually living in, in the timeless dimension of the universe. And that's why it feels so peaceful when you can't be still. Because as you know, time is a factor of fear, anxiety and stress, right? Stress is uh, time related. So much to do and so little time. And for some people when they go to shopping center, so many things to buy and so little money <laughs> or so little time. <laughs> Same thing. <laughs> Because mindfulness is a timeless state. Eternity is actually now. I, I discovered that. I was searching for eternity when I went to India. I discovered the silent mind, I discovered the nature of thinking, and I realized what eternity was. I thought eternity was, you know, millions, zillions of years in the future. But when the mind becomes silent, you realize eternity is now. It's a timeless state of the universe. And of course, if you get a chance to go to the park, and look at trees, look at plants, look at flowers, and you see how still they are. They can teach us about stillness. And as you know, when we're very busy, very preoccupied, the present moment has very little meaning, right? It's always about schedule, past and future, always. And as we said, in mindfulness, we learn how to, to objectify feelings and emotions. Hmm? Don't identify with them. Hmm? There is even stress. Instead of saying, I am stressed, just say, there is stress. Hmm? There is anxiety. Hmm? There is upset. Hmm? Hmm? There is fear. There is desire. Don't identify with it. Because when you identify with it, we hold on to it as something personal. But feelings and emotions, just like thinking, is a part of the body-mind process. Hmm? Physical, mental phenomena is just part of it. Hmm? And what the Dhamma is teaching us is that uh, as human beings, we have this unfortunate habit of identifying with things that are impermanent. Hmm? Whether it's physical, mental, or emotional. Hmm. It's always changing because we're a process. And whatever we identify with 
of course, we want it to be permanent. But if we identify with something which is unpleasant, then of course we want it to, to go away as quick as possible. But anything that's pleasant, that feels good, we want it you know, to be permanent. Or we want it to last as long as possible. So this is why the Dharma is teaching us to stop identifying with things. Hmm. To see it objectively, know it's impermanent, and you let it go. Hmm. Are there any specific sitting position for meditation? No. No specific. You, and if you can't sit cross-legged, you can sit in a chair, no problem. So long as I stay with my in-breath and out-breath, am I practicing correctly? Or are there any further practices in progress in meditation? Yes, as I mentioned, there's mindful walking, dynamic mindfulness, hand movements. Qigong is a form of meditation also. Hmm? So meditation is not just sitting. Hmm? Yes, eating, mindful eating. Anything you do, if you do it mindfully, is a form of practice. Hmm? Just being present. Hmm? Cooking, cleaning, washing. And as a traveler, I'm still washing things by hand. Hmm? <laughs> I'm so used to it. And there's a form of meditation, it's called nature meditation, or you can call it open awareness meditation. Very natural. We did this uh, end of October. We did a morning session at uh, Lake Garden, you know, behind uh, Central, Central Station, from 7 to 10 because, you know, it, it warms up very quickly. We started with Qigong, we did some uh, mindful walking, then sitting, mm -hmm. sitting under the trees. And then I told people, now open your eyes and just look and listen. Mm -hmm. Look at things going, coming and going. People coming and going, birds coming and going. You can see some animals in the trees, see cloud, just watch clouds floating in the sky. Sometimes you see a jet passing over. Just be aware. And be aware of the space, spacious awareness. Because awareness by nature is, is spacious. Hmm? But if you're always thinking, there is no space. Hmm? And you can see it in your own experience, right? When your mind is very calm, you can, you're aware of space. And for example, it's because of awareness that we can experience the space of this room, hmm? this hall. But if I'm busy thinking about something, I cannot be aware of the space in the room. And space is one of the elements. We'll do this uh, later. And this kind of meditation is very natural. Because as a child, I used to do this all the time. Just sitting in the backyard and just looking and listening. Very natural. But I didn't know it was meditation. <laughs> it's something natural. Just look and listen. See sounds coming and going, and so on. And it's very peaceful, because you're not practicing, you know, a certain method. You know, according to Burmese style, or Thai style, or Sri Lankan style, you know. It's something very natural. Hmm. 
How do you differentiate the Qigong that you shared with Zeneng Qigong by Professor Bang of China? I don't know this person. Of course, there are many different types of Qigong, right? Just look at YouTube, many different styles. But the style I do is, um, it must be from, uh, from Guangdong. Because first of all, when people ask me who my, who my Qigong master is, they're expecting some great master from China. And I say, oh, it's my sister. <laughs> and they're surprised. And I'm always thanking her for showing me Qigong. Because everywhere I go, I do Qigong now. But she learned it from a, a Chinese doctor from Hong Kong, but living in Toronto. So if he's from Hong Kong, it's very likely that this style is from Guangdong, you know, close by. But there are many styles. But I, what I like with this style is that you keep coming back to balancing, right? The balancing. Very nice. What is the ultimate sign of excellent health? <laughs> hmm. Flying. <laughs> Flying Qigong. <laughs> I would say, you know, you're naturally more energetic and you feel more, how do you say, more positive about things. You know, once I found a bottle of liquid uh, ginseng from Korea. And you know, Korean ginseng is very hot, it's very strong. But I didn't know how strong it was. It was a small bottle and there were no instructions how much to drink. It's a small bottle, but it's about this high. And I drank about m just over half of it. And I had to give a talk the, uh, that afternoon, and I was si si sitting up on the desk, and I, and I was swinging my leg. One leg was free, and people were watching me, my leg going up and down. <laughs> But I wasn't aware of it. But the interesting thing is that I'd forgotten that I drank this ginseng. And the next three days I woke up and I felt like 10 or 12 years old again. Really. So young, so positive, you know, so innocent. I'd forgotten that I <laughs> drank the ginseng. But only after three, four days, then, then I remembered. It was quite amazing. <laughs> but I must say, thanks to Qigong, uh, it has helped me a lot with energy, with health. And sometimes people ask me my age, if they're brave enough. And sometimes I say, I'm actually over 100, but thanks to Qigong, I look slightly younger. <laughs> Only slightly. But some people, they want a number, you see. We're so attached to numbers. So I usually say, I'm timeless. Timeless, what do you mean? What does your birth certificate say? <laughs> <laughs> because you see, once I pass 30, I stop counting. <laughs> I stop counting. Because you begin to realize that age is not a number. Hmm? You realize when you get, it's not a number, it's how you feel. It's really true. You know the saying, you're as old or as young as you feel. And believe me, some, some days I feel like six years old, and some days 106. It's like that. <laughs> but I say timeless because when you practice and you're living a simple life, you know, I don't have a nine-to-five job, you know, at a company. Uh, the mind is timeless, meaning you're more in the present moment. Mm. Although, you know, of course I have a, a date book, you know, with a schedule, but apart from the, the schedule, you're more in the present moment. 
and the present moment is timeless. But some people, when I say timeless, they can't understand it. You know, they think I'm trying to be very smart, you know, like a wise guy, I'm trying to be a wise guy. Or they think I'm watching too many space programs, you know, like Star Trek and those things on TV. How do we know that we are in the pink of health without going for medical checkup? Mm. Again, your energy level. Mm. See, feel your energy level. Mm. And in case of doubt, do some Qigong. <laughs> I have a good story about Qigong. Uh, I'll tell it later on. There's a young lady that is constantly having fear and insecurity. When probed further, she was one child born out of wedlock. How could we help to overcome it? Fear and insecurity. I try to meditate, but I have a tense body and can't relax. Causing posture pain, what shall I do? In this case, tense body, I would recommend yoga, yoga asana. Because I used to do yoga, I used to have even classes. And I discovered on the way to India, this is how mindfulness began. The early forest monks developed the yoga postures, what they call asana in India. And it was done very slowly, mindfully. Just simple ones, you don't have to do the complex postures. That's how it all began. They began, you know, Mindfulness of the body, breathing, stretching, sensations. And so the body naturally became very flexible, very relaxed. So when they did mindful breathing afterwards, effortless. That's how it started. And this is many centuries before the Buddha. So when Siddhartha Gautama went into the forest, he was following that ancient tradition. But some people will say, but I thought yoga was Hindu. You must remember the Buddha came from India. You know, he didn't come from Burma or Thailand or Korea or Japan or Sri Lanka. He came from India. So that's what I would recommend. Some yoga and then of course you can do some Qigong if you're feeling stressed. But I remember many years ago when I was in the working world, I would always do yoga at least half an hour after work. I'll put some relaxation music on, you know, put some loose clothes on and do at least half an hour, 45 minutes yoga. And one helpful thing about doing anything physical is that you really bring your mind in the present moment. You're no longer at work. Because hmm? many people have this problem. Physically they're at home, but mentally they're still at work, right? And you're still thinking about some conflict you have with a, your coworker or your boss, or you didn't reach your target and you know, all that stuff. But I know those who do computer work, it's even hard to let go. Because you still, you, you can work from home, right? Yes. Mm. That's the thing. You just have to uh, turn it off, at least for one hour. <laughs> and of course, your smartphone, put it away, even for one hour. Put it away if you can. Mm. 
my, mo my mother is in, in her 80s and we try to guide her to learn to let go. What can we do? I know for older people it's more difficult because hmm. they haven't practiced, you know, when they were younger. I would say either show her some simple Qigong if she can do it or show her the hand movements. But the simplest thing is chanting. Mm, teach her some simple chanting. And maybe using the beads, right? The beads, maybe. Either Ami Tofo. If she, some people are used to Ami Tofo, right? Mm. And she's not used to it. Teach her the Gate Gate chant. Something simple. Mm, get her just, just the focus. But we'll try the hand movements and see. But if she can't do it, just go to chanting. Yeah. Just to clarify, when we are in a dualistic state, the problem that may arise is that we take our feelings or thoughts personally, right? Therefore, we need to be mindful of this and try to decenter. That's right. You objectify things. Because when you objectify something, it's no longer personal, right? You just see it as it is. It's just phenomena. Because things arise because of certain conditions, things pass away. It's very useful to remember that. Because I know it, this is a big problem in North America, the way they are conditioned. They take everything so personally. You know, even things that are not directly connected to them, somehow they take it personally. You know, it's a crazy form of conditioning because the sense of I is so strong. So I see that there's more fear, more insecurity, more uh, craving, more greed. Even very successful people. They're still greedy because when you're insecure, it doesn't matter how much you have, it's just never enough. Because hmm? the fear is there, the anxiety is there. Hmm. And of course, you're always worried about what people are saying or thinking about you, you know, the fear of public opinion. Hmm. Because we have an image of ourselves. Now, of course, it is better to have a positive image of yourself than to have a negative image. But even if you have a positive image of yourself, you're still trying to protect it somehow. So it might be positive, but if somebody comes along and, you know, criticizes you, or call you names, you see how quickly your image changes. So the question is, is it possible not to have an image of yourself? Because hmm? if you don't have an image of yourself, naturally, there's no fear of public opinion, right? People can say what they like, people can think what they like. Because in truth, how can you stop people from talking? How can you stop people from thinking? <laughs> right? Cannot. And that means to trust in awareness, present moment awareness. Because the image of who you are or who you think you are is always created by thinking mm, an image. But the more we practice, we begin to have more trust, more confidence, in present moment awareness. Hmm? The unconditioned state. You can call it our Buddha nature. Hmm? Our wisdom mind. And this is a true meaning of taking refuge in the Buddha. Of course, you know, when we do ceremony, you know, we chant, you know, Buddham Saranam Gachami, that is only traditional ceremony. But the real refuge uh, as a practice is the refuge, the confidence, the trust in our Buddha nature. 
present moment awareness. So there's no image, you don't cling to an image. And this is why one of the most beneficial and healthy practices we can do is to laugh at ourselves, learning to laugh at ourselves. <laughs> That's why people are doing laughing yoga. You know laughing yoga. It's the same thing. Mm. Learning how to laugh at life, laugh at our problems, laugh at our challenges, and of course laugh at ourselves. Very healthy. Because mm. the problem is not really the self, the I, the ego, but is our strong attachment to it. Mm. Taking ourselves too seriously. If you work with an abusive boss, do you just watch your feelings and let it pass? This is a good question. If you have an abusive boss, of course you have to learn to be patient, not to react to his abuse. Do this, breathe and smile. Yes, do it right in front of him. <laughs> and smile. And yes, you'll be very confused. <laughs> and when you don't react to, say, an abusive person, you realize that they, they're suffering, you know? That's why they're being abusive. And usually they have a lot of fear. Yeah, the fear is there, insecurity. And this is a universal problem. Because you find that there are many people, they don't have the talent or the skill hmm, to be good bosses, good supervisors. Hmm, but they get into these positions and because of their insecurity, you know, th they make life very uncomfortable in the work environment. This is a universal problem. Even in people in government. I see it in Canada. Because humans are humans. <laughs> it is the human condition. We're, not, we're just not perfect. Sometime when the boss is being abusive, maybe you can try this. Just breathe and smile and say to your boss, I'm really sorry that you're not, you're not feeling well today. <laughs> Please tell me how I can help you. Try it and see. Because once a friend of mine was doing a three month work uh, project hmm, at the company and her su his supervisor was this lady. And she was obviously having problems at home, you know. She should come every morning, or most mornings, and she would just start bitching at people. You know the word bitching? You know that word? Some people are not. In the West, everybody knows that word. <laughs> you know, being very um, unprofessional, put it that way. Hmm? Not very calm, not very rational. Just bitching. And she was not aware of her behavior. She was only acting out, you know, her frustrations, her anger. Obviously it was with her husband and maybe children too. She wasn't aware, just acting out. Not very professional. So my friend asked me, do you have anything to suggest? How to deal with this very difficult person? I said, yes, you can try this, but you must try it. And you're there for three months anyway, you're leaving after three months. You, you try it, you have nothing to lose. The important thing is that you keep calm and you don't get angry at this person. Because sometimes, you know, you're tempted to, you want to tell that person off, right? <laughs> and say to her one morning when she's behaving unprofessionally, Say to her in a very calm way, I'm really sorry that you're not feeling well today. Please tell me how I can help you, the same thing. And he did it one morning. 
And two days later, he called me and he said, thank you very much. It really helped a lot. Because first by saying to her calmly, I'm really sorry that you're not feeling well today, it made her aware of her mental state, you know, her mind, because she wasn't aware of it. And by saying to her with kindness, please tell me how I can help you. She changed her attitude because she was obviously suffering, right? And because he expressed kindness, you know, metta, she changed. So maybe with this abusive boss you can try that. And if the boss is not receptive, just say, I'm sorry, I see you later when you're feeling much better and you walk away. Can you do that? Just say, I'll see you later. You know, see you later, alligator. <laughs> yeah, I'll see you later when you're feeling much better. You smile and you walk away. And if you're not courageous to do that, just breathe and smile. <laughs> but remember, it's his problem, it's not yours, right? He's obviously, it's his own mental, mental state. But it's usually because, you know, of stress. Because normally bosses, they're getting pressure from up there, from above, you know. You know, their bosses. And they put pressure on the boss, and the boss doesn't have the skill or the talent. So, you know, they behave um, very difficult. So it's really a blessing when you can have a good boss. You know, a person that has the natural skill and that's the, they just have a natural temperament, you know. If you work in a team that disregards your views, even if they, they have been proven right, or your views have been proven right, should you continue to work for that team? Okay. Or just watch your feelings and let them pass. I might be wasting my potential continuing working with that team. Mm. Yeah, that's a good question. I would say, yes, you can watch your feelings, you know, not reacting. Also, you can try to What's the word? You try to assert yourself, but in a calm, constructive way. You understand about that? Con how to assert yourself, but in a very calm, positive way. Assert yourself means you speak directly, honestly, but calmly. Hmm? Not out of anger. Because most of us, we have to be angry first before we can assert ourselves. Because you know that's the nature of anger, right? When you feel very angry, somehow you lose that fear. But normally when we act out of anger, it's usually unskillful. And then we regret, we, you know, we re regret behaving that way. So maybe you can try, try to assert yourself but in a very direct, positive way. And if people cannot appreciate it, then you either let it go and stay calm, or you work with another team. Hmm? Because yes, you're right, you, you might be wasting your potential. How do I deal with a very restless and worried mind? Hmm. Do the dynamic practice first. Hmm. Do dynamic. And if possible, you can do some yoga, do some qigong, and you find that your, your mind becomes uh, you know, more relaxed. But the, the hand movements is very helpful.
how do you how to tackle a constantly fault finding mind? Yeah, many people have this habit, always finding faults, mm, always complaining. In Singapore, I was talking about this because sometimes, same in the West, when you know, when when we become more developed, more modern, we have more conveniences, and we become very spoiled, and we take things for granted. And if, even if things are almost perfect, you will find something to complain about. And this is why the practice of gratitude is so important. Be grateful for what you have. Don't take things for granted. And to know that the fault-finding mind is suffering, isn't it? It's suffering. It's suffering. But it's an unhealthy habit. I met a lady in Singapore. She was always getting upset about this or that. Her neighbor, you know, would wash, put her laundry outside. She saw, she would see the, the laundry outside and she would get upset. I said, the problem is not the laundry. <laughs> it's your mind, right? Your mind is reacting to it. Stop it. And tell yourself you're not, you're not as important as you think. Because that's the thing about the complaining, fault finding mind, you know, the ego. Hmm? You become very arrogant, very proud. And you don't realize it until somebody points it out to you. Hmm? Yeah, don't take things for granted. Hmm? Be grateful, be thankful for what you have. Hmm? And if you get stuck in traffic, and you find yourself getting upset, Breathe and smile and say to yourself, I should be thankful that at least I have a car. <laughs> I have a car to drive. <laughs> be patient. Believe me, the traffic congestion here is nothing compared to Jakarta. Yes, I've been to Jakarta twice in the last three years. And what impressed me so much about the people there, they're so patient. You have to be. You have no choice. You know, because you're having over 16, 17 million people and just countless vehicles and, of course, countless motorbikes, scooters. Because, you know, many people can afford scooters, they can't afford cars. But they're so patient and they have to. Because they realize, too, that if you're not patient, you go mad. You know, you go mad. So you have to be patient. <laughs> so it doesn't matter how much you scream and shout and get angry and honking your horn, it doesn't work. <laughs> you just have to re be relaxed and go with the flow, as they say. No choice. Very patient. And then, of course, when I go back to Singapore, you see the total opposite. I said, you people, you don't know what traffic jam is. <laughs> Stop complaining, be patient, you know. But for the fault-finding mind, what can be helpful when you see something and you just notice you're about to, to find fault, just say, seeing, 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 hearing, hearing, hearing. And do, do the breathing. F focus. Just like people who cannot uh, resist in the shopping center, you see something for sale. Some people cannot uh, resist that. And later you regret buying it, right? Or you spend too much. So if you see that sign, just breathe mindfully and you say, seeing, 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 and you walk away and you let it go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.
You see something else you want, same thing. Seeing, seeing, seeing. Breathe and you let go. It's a good practice actually. Go to the shopping center and just do that. And make sure you don't buy a single thing. <laughs> and you'll be very pleased that you've saved a lot of money. In Hong Kong, I try to get people to do that. Because they're even more crazy about shopping. And they're mad about, you know, the European brand name items. And they told me that even many co-workers, they compete against each other to see who can outdress each other. Can you imagine? Real delusion with all these expensive, you know, European brand name items, including all the accessories, you know, dress, shoes, handbag, everything, jewelry, hairstyle, everything. And you know, the funny irony is that in the end, they all look, they end up looking the same. <laughs> That's the irony. You have to laugh at it. It's, it's delusion. Hmm? It seems so difficult not to keep abreast with news on the social media, how to let go of this addiction for stimulation. Hmm. Now, I'm on Facebook, but I only post um, Dharma teaching. You know, I don't put, put pictures up. This is what I had for breakfast. This is what I had for lunch. Here are my photos of, you know. For one thing, I don't have a smartphone, so I don't take cameras. You know, I don't have this smartphone camera. So that, uh, that helps me a lot. But I realize how strong this media is. Because I grew up before internet. You know, I put a posting up, and within uh, 10 minutes already I have like, 10 uh, responses around the world, from around the world. And within 24, within 12 hours, I get 40 to 60 responses. And I'm, I'm always amazed at this, how strong the social media is. Hmm. But I'm always open to questions. The only thing I use on internet is email and YouTube. And I'm aware of even YouTube can be addicting. Because you know, there are so many good videos. And if you have free time, you can spend the whole day watching videos. But what has helped me is just the, uh, the awareness, the mindfulness. And there's a time when my body tells me it's time to stop. I turn it off and I go walking. Even in the winter. Last winter I was in Canada. I decided to stay in Canada. Even winter I enjoyed walking. If it's not too windy. Because right? you have the wind chill factor. But if it's not too windy, it feels really wonderful just to walk. And when I'm outside, I'm moving, I feel the chi, it feels so good. And believe me, when I'm out there walking, although it can be chilly, I don't miss YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, just be able to let it go, give it a rest, do something else. I think the, the mindfulness, you know, with social media, you have to see how, um, lis listen to your body. Hmm? Observe what your, uh, the, your mental state, see how your eyes, how your eyes feel. Maybe they're getting tired. Hmm? Yeah. Listen to your body. How does your body feel just sitting? Hmm? And then maybe 
the body will tell you what to do. Hmm? Listen to the body. I would like to know if it's possible to detach from relationship amongst family members. If you're attached too much with the relationship, does it add to our suffering? Hmm. You're looking at somebody who had to teach my own uh, siblings about non-attachment. So the question is, is it possible to love, to care about people without attachment? That has something to reflect on. Because, you know, too much attachment is not healthy, right? Mm. You know, after I came back from uh, my second visit to India, I was away for over two years. This is before internet, but I would write letters. So when I got back, I, I was with uh, both of my sisters, and they asked me, we can't understand why you're spending so much time in India away from Canada. We can't understand it. And then uh, my sister asked me, don't you love us anymore? And I said, I will always love you. And if you ever need my help, you know, I will do my best to help you because we weren't brought up with you know materialistic stuff but one thing you have to understand is that I'm not depending on you for my happiness but I'll always help you and I always care about you but I'm not depending on you for my happiness and when I said that then they understood that the problem they were having with me, you know, being away, was, is their own attachment. Mm. Their own attachment. Mm. So once I explained that, they could see that it was their own attachment, yeah. And of course, sometimes family members can be difficult. And if there is difficulty, then you stay away from them. Stay away. And don't feel guilty about it. Don't feel guilty about it. And don't say, oh, you know, it's my brother or my sister or, you know, my mother. I must, you know, I must be respectful. I must do this. I must. No, no. If it's too much suffering, simply stay away. Or as they say, give them space. Hmm? Give yourself space and give them space. And if they need your help, then you can respond. Huh? You can respond in a, in a good way. So if this is an aspect of wisdom, using wisdom. How do we use mindfulness to help us achieve our goals in life? How do we live skillfully in the world with the knowledge of non-duality? Hmm. Okay. Now in Dharma practice you always hear about the present moment, right? The importance of the present moment. Now, it is natural to have goals, you know, future plans, what we call hopes and dreams, and so on. It's very natural. But the important thing is that we shouldn't be too attached to those goals, meaning not to get too obsessed about those goals.
because if we get too attached, too obsessed, we're asking for trouble. You know, anxiety, fear, and so on. Mm -hmm. The fear that I won't achieve my goals. Mm -hmm. I won't achieve what I want to achieve. So have those goals in mind. But, and also, they should be tentative, you know, tentative, hmm? a flexible idea. Because the truth is, the future is uncertain. Hmm? Anything can happen. And sometimes we change, you know, we, we change our priorities. And this is why sometimes when we achieve a certain goal, we're disappointed. Because hmm? it's not what we expected. Mm, or we're expecting too much. Mm. And yes, very often we achieve a certain goal and we feel good, you know, a sense of achievement. But that sense of achievement, how long does it last? Mm. Somebody once said two weeks maximum. <laughs> and that's maximum, two weeks. And then when that feeling goes away, then y you want to achieve something else. Again, because we're this process, constantly changing. You know, there's a very unique, maybe you've, you've heard about this, where there are a few people who are able to achieve all their goals, even at a fairly young, young age, say middle age in their 40s and they felt good they had a sense of achievement but after two weeks when that feeling went away they began to panic can you imagine some people began to panic and you wonder how is that possible they began to panic simply because when that feeling of achievement, success went away, the grasping mind wanted to achieve something else. Because, you know, all their lives they were, you know, used to achieving a goal. And suddenly there were no more goals to achieve. Hmm? Hence the panic. Very interesting. And in desperation, very often, they'll try and find another goal, although they don't really need it. And interestingly enough, a friend of mine in Singapore went through the same thing. Just first, I read about these cases, and then it also happened this friend in Singapore was suffering from the same problem. He's an emergency uh, medicine doctor. And he's, he's one of these guys, from he's this old, he was always an A-plus child. A-plus. And he told me, all during school, if he got an A instead of an A-plus, that would be failure to him. Can you imagine? <laughs> No, a was not good enough. It had to be A+. Plus. And you can imagine he had no problem getting into, you know, medical school, right, with his A+. Plus. But even as a medical student, he was always competing. He had to be the number one medical student. Because that's what he, he was used to, it, you know, that competition. And he thought this was normal. But behind that competition, that competitive attitude, there was always some anxiety, some fear. But he thought this was perfectly normal. <laughs> you know, he got used to that feeling. And only when he started to do Dhamma practice that he began to realize the, the suffering behind all this. So anyway, here he was now. He completed all his training to be, you know, a fully qualified emergency medical doctor. 
six months special course in Taiwan in, in Mandarin medium and six month course in United States in English medium. Fully, fully qualified, no more study. And he felt pleased with himself and sure enough, after two weeks, he began to panic. <laughs> Quite amazing. It's, but it's the craving mind. What to do? And I said, it's time to sit on your meditation cushion and learn just to be. Because you're caught in craving. Hmm? And the fear of not achieving what you're craving for. In Dhamma language, we call it becoming. And he's caught in this craving to become, to achieve, to have. And with the fear of not becoming, not achieving. Just learn how to be. And this is one of the aspects of meditation, learning how to be. Because, you know, in our busy lives, we always think we have to do something, right? but just learning how to be. Because in that state of being, we're free from time. No craving, no regretting, just being. And also he said to me that the head of the department at the hospital was going to retire and they wanted him to take over this uh, position. Should I take it? He has two young children. Of course, it will mean higher salary, but more administrative work. And I said to him, do not take that position. And uh, you you need to spend more quality time with your children hmm? and help your wife. Your children grow up very fast. Do not take that position. So he thanked me for the advice. <laughs> How do we live skillfully in the world with the knowledge of non-duality. Hmm. Again, just objectify things in daily life. Get into that habit, including stress. You know, there is stress. If the mind is worrying about something, you know, just say there is worry. Objectify it. And remind yourself, this too shall pass. Hmm. It is impermanent. Come back to present moment. And it also teaches us patience, how to be patient. Because patience is a great virtue. But as you know, our lives are getting faster and faster. So patience is, the, is not something that is valued. I think part of it too is the speed of internet. The media is getting too fast. I think part of it is that. Because you know, in the business world, when you send an email, you're expecting, you know, instant result, right? And you find now, even your personal email, if you don't get a reply within 12 hours, you, you get anxious. Hmm? What's happening, you know? What's happened to the person? Are they in trouble? Don't they like me anymore? <laughs> Are they trying to avoid me? <laughs> you know, I grew up writing letters. And I'm still amazed at the speed of email. And I remember posting a letter and not being in a hurry to get a reply. And if I got a reply, that was nice, and how I didn't get a reply, that was also good. Hmm. 
So mindfulness can help us with non-duality and also to come back to present moment, timelessness. Because that state of non-duality helps us also not to take things so personally. Don't take things so personally. Yeah, the question about fear, fear is, um, I don't have time to go through the different types of fears. I think it was recorded here, I think in November, I gave a talk in November about the nature of fear. I think, I think, um, I think Bobby uh, recorded it. But it's a good topic to, um, to discuss fear because we can all relate to fear on all the different types of fears we have. But basically it comes from thinking. It really comes from thinking. Hmm? Either about the past with regret and guilt or you know, the future hmm? with uncertainty. So uh, thinking is a factor of fear, time of course, past and future, and desire, mm? desire, craving. Because mm? what we desire, what we crave, there's always, always the fear of not mm, getting what we want. Basically it's that. And we mentioned about the fear of uh, public opinion. There's also the fear of um, not being accepted, not being loved, the fear of rejection. Hmm? That's also a childhood fear. You know, not getting enough attention, not getting enough love as a child. Fear of authority is also f from childhood. You know, if you, ha you have a strict parents, that's where it starts. And we carry that fear into um, into school, you know, fear of the teacher, fear of the, the, the principal. Then in the work environment, you know, fear of the, the boss or the supervisor. Mm -hmm. Another childhood fear we have is the fear of ghosts and spirits. This is why I like to do the cemetery meditation. We did it three times in Singapore. It was very successful. But most of the time when I invite people to meditate with me in the cemetery, at night of course, <laughs> not in daylight, that's cheating, <laughs> most people won't come. They will laugh, yes, but they won't come. In Penang, I had a good chance to do it because this one center called Bodhi Heart Sanctuary is right in the middle of a cemetery. So when I heard about this center, I thought, great, we got to do this. Perfect location. <laughs> you can't avoid the graves. So I inspired 12 people. So we start sitting and after five minutes, it starts to rain. I said, don't worry, be patient, be calm, the rain will go away. It didn't go away. <laughs> <laughs> Soaking wet, we said, okay, let's go inside. And I think the spirits were laughing at us, <laughs> so these stupid idiots, but what are they trying to do? <laughs> but if I, if I ever go back to uh, Penang, I'll try it again. But it's good. 
I'm just curious, how many people here would be interested to do a cemetery meditation? <laughs> okay, one, two, three, good, four, five. Believe me, it's all in the imagination. It's all in the imagination. I like to tell people, you know, in Jamaica, I grew up with African ghosts and spirits. And there's quite a few of them. So because I grew up with African ghosts and spirits, I'm not afraid of the Chinese ghosts and spirits. <laughs> but in Singapore, we, you know, we rented a bus. We had about 25 people. They were very inspired. And Buddhist fellowship, you know, they're very organized. And they said, this is your chance. You know, this crazy monk from Canada, he's offering this chance. This is your, your opportunity to deal with this fear. And we arrived very early, at least one hour before sunset. So we had time to practice as it got darker and darker. But I must say, the cemeteries in Singapore are not very spooky. <laughs> the ones in Malaysia are, mo are more spooky. <laughs> And I remember there was one uh, Indonesian lady, because you know, there are a lot of Indonesians in uh, Singapore, you know, studying, working, and so on. And she was really scared. But she, you know, wanted to take up this challenge. And you can imagine some people wanted to sit together in a group. I said, no, 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 that's cheating. <laughs> you have to sit apart. So I told this one lady, you sit at this grave, okay? And she looked at the picture, you know, each grave has a photo. <laughs> and she says, uh, Bante, are you really sure about this? <laughs> I said, don't worry, la. The spirit is not going to complain. But she wasn't convinced. She said, suppose I tried all the practices that you suggested. In, including chanting, you know, dynamic and so on. Hmm? How to manage. <laughs> and suddenly I had this crazy idea and I said, sing the happy birthday song. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, happy birthday. And she was so surprised that I said that, she started to laugh. And because she, she started laughing, the fear, the nervousness went away. And she ended up having a very good meditation. Now you could say people were really happy, inspired, that they were able to overcome this fear. Because it's really in the imagination. Here's one practice I often do. Everywhere I go, I do it. And I really suggest you try it, to see how good your mindfulness is. You're alone one night, one evening, 20 minutes, put away your handphone, no TV. You're alone in a room. And you say to yourself, there's something in the room. <laughs> there's a presence in the room. You try it. And the moment you say that, you feel goosebumps. And you feel something watching you from behind. Yes, that is the power of the imagination. Every time I do it myself, the same thing. I get the goosebumps and I feel something behind me, watching. And if you're not mindful, of course, you quickly leave the room. But if you apply mindfulness, you overcome it. And you realize it's just the power of the imagination. Hmm? So I dare you to try this. <laughs> it's good. It's very good. But it really shows you the power of the imagination. Because a few people in KL over the years have told me, I cannot meditate alone at night. Too scared. Because they, you know, they think the spirit is going to come. But it's the imagination.
Very powerful. Very, very powerful. Mm. So as we said, we have this I, this me, but that is only language, or what we call a uh, human convention, the idea of self. But there is that deeper reality of, you know, body-mind process, rupa and nama. And you, you can see it when you're mindful. And you go below this body-mind process, you know you have the five aggregates, right? Now, many people, when you hear or read about the aggregates, it seems complicated. And you don't see how these five things are working in your daily life. This is why I like to give a simple example of these five things working. Because what is interesting is that these five things are working all the time, but we're not aware of them. You know, physical form with its sense organs. You have feelings or sensation. You have perception. You have mental reaction. And you have consciousness. Sounds complicated, right? Okay, perception, because some people are not really sure about perception, is the ability to recognize a sense object. For example, you listen to the radio and you recognize a song. And sometimes you recognize the singer, the artist. That's perception at work. And in this part of the world, even if you travel outside of Malaysia, hmm, say if you go to Australia or you go to Europe or North America, the moment you smell durian, you know exactly what it is, right? That is perception. So in other words, perception is related to memory, past experience. For example, in North America, we have you know, four or five big Chinatowns. San Francisco, Vancouver, Toronto, New York. And in Chinatown, these Chinatowns, you get all the fruits from Southeast Asia. You know, rambutan, mangis, durian, all these fruits. And many white Americans or Canadians, they will go there and they will see these fruits, but they have no idea what these fruits are. But if you or, or I go there, you know exactly what those fruits are. So that's perception. Hmm? Relating to memory, past experience. And consciousness is something which is always changing. It's not something which is, you know, permanent or stable in the mind. Always changing. Give you a good example. When you had lunch, part of consciousness was tasting and smelling, right? But at this moment, there is no tasting or smelling. What do we have in consciousness? Seeing, hearing, and you feel your body sitting, right? Now close your eyes for a moment. There's no seeing, but there's still hearing and feeling. Okay? Now open your eyes, and you see seeing consciousness arises again. That is the nature of consciousness. And later, when you're at home, you start eating something or drinking, then tasting and smelling will be a part of consciousness. And tonight when we all go to bed and we go into deep sleep state, there is no consciousness. That's right. For at least between one to two hours a deep sleep state. This is before dreams. We actually die. I don't know if you've heard this before. We actually die mentally, psychologically, 
every night. No consciousness. Hmm? Body might be alive, no consciousness, no thinking, and no I. That's right. That's why there's a very old saying when somebody's in deep sleep and they're not aware of anything, we say that person is dead to the world. Have you heard that saying before? It's a very old saying. Somebody's dead to the world. Meaning they're not aware of anything. Malaysia does not exist. Including the politicians. <laughs> Can you imagine, even your house, your family, they do not exist in deep sleep state. Very interesting. But when the mind or the brain comes out of deep sleep state, then the thought process starts up again. And that's what we call the dream state. And if you observe your dreams, you see most of the dreams are all memories, all mixed up. Have you noticed that? You know, including some fantasy, sometimes some anxiety will come. If you're having a conflict in your life, sometimes it comes out in your dream. Sometimes an important appointment is coming up, some important event, very likely you dream about it. Hmm? or you're about to take a trip somewhere hmm? and you're a bit excited about it, sometimes you dream about it. And in that dream, sometimes you get to the airport and you missed your flight. <laughs> hmm? And you get all anxious, but then you wake up, oh, it's only a dream. The dreams are very interesting, but it's all mixed up memory because thinking is related to memory, hmm? past experience and so on. Hmm. So here's the simple example I like to give of the five aggregates working. You're taking a, a walk in the park or in the bush somewhere, of course your physical form is involved, you hear something Hmm? So here in consciousness, you look to the sound and your eyes see an object. With perception, you recognize that object as, say, a frog or a snake. From that recognition comes feeling or sensation. If you happen to like frogs or snakes, what type of feeling are you going to have? Pleasant, right? You know, you're happy to see the frog or the snake. On the other hand, if you don't like frogs or snakes, ugh, the opposite happens, right? Aversion, fear, hmm? anxiety. If it's a pleasant experience, then comes your mental reaction. You might decide, oh, let me stop and watch. Hmm? The frog hopping, or the snake, you know, slithering. Because there's no fear, no aversion. Or maybe you, m you might want to play with him. But if you don't want to touch the frog or a snake, you might take, you know, a stick, a little stick, and you just gently play. But no fear, no aversion. But if there is fear, aversion, your mental reaction would be to quickly walk away and sometimes even run <laughs> if you're really scared. So that's an example of the five things working. But normally we don't recognize them because they happen so quickly hmm? and they're impermanent. And there's no permanent self, no permanent I involved. And they are interdependent. Hmm? These five things are interdependent. They work together. And I say this because one common mistake 
that people make is to say that consciousness continues after death. Well, this is my understanding anyway. Because you cannot really separate consciousness from the other four aggregates. You understand? Because they're interdependent, interconnected. It's like you cannot separate your nose from your face. Because, hmm? you know, your nose is a part of your face. So the question is, why do we do this? Hmm? Why do we say consciousness continues after death? Or, you know, consciousness takes rebirth. There are two reasons. One is simply wishful thinking. Because <laughs> as long as we're trapped in thinking and we're very attached to this I, which is created by thinking, somehow we want to continue after death. And that's why we believe, we want to believe in an afterlife. I spoke about this yesterday and in Singapore. And there's so many different beliefs in an afterlife. Reincarnation, rebirth is only one belief. Many be beliefs. So, Yes, wishful thinking, we want to continue somehow because, let's, because death is the great unknown, isn't it? The great mystery. And the second reason is because thinking is limited. Hmm? Thinking can only see things in fragments. Hmm? It can see things in isolation. It cannot see the whole. Yeah, do you understand this? Thinking cannot see how everything is interconnected, interdependent. So thinking says, of course, you know, I'll take rebirth. <laughs> Our consciousness takes rebirth. But awareness, our mindfulness, gives us the ability to see things more clearly and we can look deeply. Because consciousness is always changing. And if you believe in, you know, the traditional rebirth, all I can say is wait and see. <laughs> Only when we die we know for sure. This is why I don't argue with people anymore. I just say, believe what you want to believe. But remember that present moment awareness, mindfulness is the most important thing. Hmm? Or Buddha nature. Hmm. Maybe before five o'clock we'll go through the elements and we'll speak about why we want to believe in an afterlife. Very fascinating subject. And why human beings have been asking this question for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. Hmm? I call it the age-old question. People are still asking the same question today. And in future they'll ask the same question. And that question is, what happens to me when I die, and where do I go after death, right? Very ancient question. But I'll give you a little taste before we do the Qigong. Ramana Maharshi, hmm, he was one of the last enlightened beings in India. He was from South India. Hmm. When he was asked this ancient question, he gave a wonderful answer. And it's related to what we just talked about, consciousness and deep sleep state. He said, tell me, when you go to bed at night and you fall asleep, where do you go? <laughs> Great answer. That's right. I, I just mentioned it. When we fall asleep. 
There's no consciousness, no thinking, no I. Very simple. But there's nothing to be afraid of. Because no I, no problem. <laughs> Just like the man in India said to me, you know, he shook his head in the Indian style and all he said was, no thing, no problem. <laughs> no thing, no problem. Or you can say, less thinking, more mindfulness, less problem. Because sometimes we need to think, right? But we tend to think too much. Hmm? When we don't need to think, the mind just keeps thinking, right? Compulsively. Mm. So that's the problem with thinking, too much. And it is not only do we um, waste a lot of mental energy, but there's, um, there's dukkha. Because part of clinging is, has to do with memory. You know, you keep clinging, you keep remembering, especially some conflict you've had or some unpleasant memory or some regret, feeling guilty. And by, when you keep thinking about it, you're mentally clinging to that. Do you see that? That's why the clinging mind is so strong. It has to do with thinking and memory. This is why somebody once said, Happiness is having, is having good health and a bad memory. <laughs> right? The ability to forget, especially unpleasant memories. Okay, so we'll have a short break and then we do some Qigong. Okay? <laughs>